Reverend Billy Graham was known around the globe, preaching to millions and even providing spiritual counsel to 13 sitting presidents, beginning with President Harry Truman. Today, the evangelist was honored when his statue was unveiled in the United States Capitol. Earlier, I spoke with Billy Graham's son, Reverend Franklin Graham, and the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson. Both spoke at today's unveiling. Gentlemen, nice to see both of you. Thank you. Thanks for being uh, here. This is the first time we've met, isn't it? Today's the first time we've met, Greta. Yeah. Yep. We've prayed for him. <laughs> He's got a tough job. A very tough job indeed, but it's a, it's a big day here at the U.S. Capitol, um, the unveiling of the sculpture of the Reverend Billy Graham. Um, were you surprised, Mr. Speaker, when uh, Reverend Graham said that his father would feel uncomfortable with the preceding day of the ceremony? I wasn't surprised at all. That was his uh, humble nature. I mean, the, one of the reasons that we revere Reverend Graham so much is because he walked that. He walked humbly with God. He was one of the most influential people of the modern era. I mean, without dispute, it's the, the numbers vary, but I mean, he's clearly was seen and heard by probably billions of people over the course of his ministry. And he walked with kings and he walked with presidents, every president since Harry Truman. And yet he had that humble spirit of a Christ follower. And that, that's why I believe God elevated his platform as he did, because he had the right heart. Reverend, I've heard you say before that, um, that what we saw publicly of your father was what, what you saw privately. It, it, it was, Greta. The, um, I think one of John Wayne's sons talking about his father said that John Wayne that the world saw on the silver screen was the same John Wayne we saw at home. And I thought to myself, that's, that, that's the way it is with my father. The Billy Graham that the world saw in the stage, in big stadiums, on television, the same man we saw at home. There wasn't two Billy Grahams. It was the same man. What kind of father was he? Uh, he was fun. He was serious, but he was fun. You know, it's one thing I've, I've, never, I've never heard my father ever say anything derogatory about anybody. He, he just didn't do that. When people would tell jokes about other people or whatever, he just never joined in. It just, he, he was just, that's, that, he was serious in those things. But he, he loved family. Um, he, he loved us children. But we didn't disobey him. Uh, we'd regret it <laughs> if we talked back to him. Mr. Speaker, you said today um, at the summer how you, you speak all the time. I mean, that's part of being a speaker as you speak. But today you said you were nervous. I really was. And, and we've even done some other unveiling of statues in Statuary Hall and other things. I, 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 don't, I don't typically get uh, have nerves about speaking, but today I did because it's Billy Graham. And right before we walked in, Greta, they handed me his study Bible with his notes in it. I mean, my hands were shaking. I'm like, this is a priceless uh, artifact here, but it's his Bible. So I, I had a few moments at my desk in the speaker's office and just flipped through to see some of the notes he had written on some of my favorite passages of scripture. Just a surreal thing. But I, I tell you what, the, the ceremony, as I'm sure people will see if they didn't watch it live, was just, I thought it was so fitting, you know, for him and the people that spoke. Everybody had a heartfelt, uh, you know, just real uh, genuine emotion about what he meant to them and what he meant to our nation. And I, I just thought it was very well done. Okay, Mr. Speaker, you're not the only lucky one today. Um, I get to hold the... Uh, blessed, blessed, not lucky. The, that is a priceless the, the, article, uh, right? The Bible of uh, Reverend Billy Graham. Right. Look at this. So, so see the sticky note there. That's what I read from that in the ceremony. And, and you see Galatians, uh, the, the, the verse that's uh, underlined there. It talks about how all glory is God's and not ours. And, yeah. where, do, where do you keep this? In the library? Is, it's kept in Charlotte at the, the Archive Center. It's not in the museum? Um, it's yeah, not. but it's part of the archive center is there at the library. So you see there, uh, W.A. Criswell was his pastor, I, yeah. I guess. And, Dr. Uh, Dr. Criswell was his yeah. pastor. Pastor? Yeah. yeah. The First Baptist Church of Dallas. Yeah. It's, and I mean, how that happened, my father was preaching. And Dr. Criswell said, now, young man, he said at the invitation, if you could step from behind the pool, that's what said, <laughs> and then walk down front. Yeah. And joined First Baptist Church of Dallas. He said you would make this old man very happy. And that's oh, what Daddy did. That's amazing. And they, he was a member of that church for oh for years. Wow. First Baptist Church of Dallas. But he's got all he's got all his little notes in here. What mm. I mean, what did, what did he? Uh, he underlined things, annotated things. Yeah. I have to confess, I took 
a bunch of screenshots of some of those pages. I was looking at my favorite passages of scripture to see what he wrote about yeah. it, and I've got some great stuff. So you took screen, you took screenshots yeah, of right, this, right? Who wouldn't? It's Billy Graham's Bible. I mean, I had to. You do may it. not get another chance at right, this, right? Unless right. we put another statue up, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it is pretty. It's pretty extraordinary to see his handwriting. But Red, he believed every page of it, and uh, he studied it. He was a student of the scriptures, uh, mm-hmm. even up to the end. And my mother memorized whole chapters of the Bible, mm-hmm. and you didn't argue with her. <laughs> oh, my goodness. She, could, she would quote chapter and verse and repeat it word for word perfect. Mm-hmm. So you, I just didn't argue with my mother. Well, your, your father also in an interview talked about someone memorizing um, chapters and in multiple languages, mm-hmm. you know, that he had met across. He'd gone all over the world. He met everybody. He went behind the Iron Curtain and preached. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, he, wherever he went, um, there was one thing in common. We met followers of Jesus Christ in every country. Mm-hmm. And we had something in common with them. And uh, when my father, uh, Greta, went to behind the Iron Curtain in Eastern Europe, this was before the wall came down. And he would go to preach in some of these churches. He would hold the Bible up, mm. almost like into the face of the, mm. of the communist who said that God was dead. He would hold the Bible up, and the, and the people, tens of thousands of people in the street trying to get in the church, he could only preach in churches. Mm. He wouldn't give him an outside audience, just inside churches because they thought they could control inside mm. the church. But they had no clue that outside the church would be 100,000 people trying to get into oh, a church yeah. that seats 200. He was up in his mountain retreat the last years of his life. And did he read the Bible all day long? Or well, his, his eyes were, were uh, he had macular degeneration the last 10 years or so of his life. So we would have to print out scripture for him mm. and be printed out like this. And he would study. And that passage of scripture that mm. uh, you read from is... That was the last sermon he, he, that he wanted to preach, uh-huh. and he was never able to preach it. That, that was, uh, well, it was one thing that was interesting. When my father was here for uh, getting the congressional uh, medal, he was standing there, and he looked around the room at all these statues. He said, all of these statues have one thing in common, and everybody was just on the edge of their seat. He said, they're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, we're going to join them soon. Mm. And then he uses scripture. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And a hundred years from now, all of us in this room are going to be dead, he said. But then we have to stand before God. And mm. he used that to, to springboard onto his message that he wanted to give that morning. Did he always have a deep faith since a very young boy or is it something that uh, came over life? Well, my, my father, uh, of course, when he was young, my father said he was interested in girls <laughs> and uh, baseball. Uh, but when he went forward at an evangelist uh, meeting, his name was Mordecai Ham, who came to North Carolina, came to Charlotte, had a meeting. My grandfather was one of the men that helped bring him to Charlotte. And uh, my father, at the invitation, he went forward. And um, he said he was nervous. He said that he didn't have any emotion. He just felt in his heart that God was calling him. And from that day forward, he, he was focused on uh, telling others about what God can do for you through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And, and he did it all over the world. I mean, when you, we, you, everyone, we all grew up seeing um, all the uh, meetings that he had. Yes, and, and what an impact. And, and it, what was, I think, so impactful about his life is that he was consistent. He, you know, he walked in integrity. As, as was noted, he was not a perfect man. None of us are perfect. But um, he, was, he was humble enough to just um, to acknowledge that and to walk it out and be consistent. And the idea of how he lived and the testimony of his family, that it was all authentic. It was all real. What you saw was what you got. And I think people appreciated that about him. When I gave remarks, I, I, I quoted presidents from both parties, all the living presidents who gave remarks after his passing in 2018. And it's just just this lavish praise because everyone, even the heads of state, saw in him a great example, a Christ-like example. And we need more of that. But there was one quote that I read, and I'm going to paraphrase and probably get it all wrong, but it was something like, um, if you lose uh, your money, all your money, you lose nothing. If you lose your health, you lose something. You lose your character, you lose everything. That's right. What a great message for Washington. <laughs> And indeed it is. Um, all right, the sculpture, it's big. It's tall. Yeah, 
fitting, I think. Fitting, not fitting, but tall. It's a, and the, uh, the sculptor is, uh, he's not new to um, statues here. Right. Uh, Chas Fagan, he's actually is the same sculptor that did the Reagan statue that's in the rotunda. Uh, so two, two of my biggest heroes, he, he has, uh, he's been the artist for both. And uh, great work. I mean, it's a great likeness of him, I think. Oh, don't you oh think? no, yeah. it's excellent. H had you seen it before it was unveiled? First. First I I've, I've saw it when it unveiled. And, and, I mean, the family participated. I know Sissy, your uh, daughter, Sissy, was involved. Sissy was involved in the, one of the committees that gave input into the, the statue. So, uh, no, I, I was very surprised. And I like the fact that he's holding the Word of God, Greta, in his hand. And my father, when he preached, he always took the Bible to the pulpit with him. Even though he may have had the passage typed out in front of him on, on a, in his notes, he still held the Bible because he wanted that to be uh, reminding, he wanted that to remind people of the authority of the scripture. Everything that my father said, everything that he believed, it came from the Bible and the word of God. And so he believed it from cover to cover, uh, as I do and as our family does. Uh, but he, he would hold the Bible. And so here he is in, now in the statutory hall holding <laughs> the word of God in his hand. And I, I like the fact that they've printed the scriptures on yeah. the base. Yeah. Uh, John three sixteen, John fourteen six. So it's on the on the base. Is is that what the the uh, Bible is open to? Because I didn't crawl up uh, on top of the sculpture. But I mean, if you crawl up that tall, is it? Uh, well, it's, what do you it's, see? It's open to Galatians, and uh, it's a passage that he had noted was going to be his last sermon. I didn't realize mm -hmm. that till you said it. But it the the, the message of that verse is that uh, I don't glory in anything except God Himself, not mm -hmm. me, because I am. Uh, I've, I've given all in that service, and, and what a great message his life was. He didn't have to preach that. He walked it out. We all saw it. You know, you know it's, it's interesting when you look at, I mean, we're in Washington now. I see we're in the U.S. Capitol. But all the presidents that uh, that he had uh, spoke to and counseled over the years and, and gave uh, pastoral advice, I mean, it's extraordinary. Going way back to Truman, right? All the way back to Truman uh, through, of course, President Trump. Uh, even though he didn't go to the White House during his presidency, he knew President Trump. And uh, so he'd had a relationship with every president since Truman. And, of course, he did some inauguration. I think that didn't did he do some prayers here, inauguration? Did he? Yes. And he, I don't know how many prayers he did here, but uh, I lost count of that. But my father um, appreciated the leadership uh, over the years. And he would come to Washington and uh, he would be a part of things that they were doing. And he made friends and made relationships. And he also played golf. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. I don't play golf, but he played golf and he got to know so many of the leadership here out on the golf course. Yep. And uh, so he used golf as a, as a way to build bridges and with both sides of the aisle. So. And boy, we could use that now, couldn't we? We could. It reminds me of what the Apostle Paul said. It would be all things to all men so that I might reach some. Maybe it was a golf game. Maybe it was something. <laughs> Whatever it took, that's what he was about all around the world. What do, what do you think he'd think today? I mean, with all that's going on in Israel. My father um, understood the complexities of the world and the nations. And, there, and he realized that there was no one person that can fix it, except one, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And my father believed firmly in praying for those that were in authority, for leadership, praying for them, because the Bible teaches us that, to pray for those that are in authority. And so uh, what we see in Israel is just what's being prophesied in Scripture. Uh, when my father was in Bible school, back in the 30s, uh, they talked about the nation of Israel and the rebirth of the nation. And as young Bible students, they were mm -hmm. looking at each other. I wonder when that's going to happen. Right. And, and then, of course, after the Second World War, the Jew, we were at Auschwitz. Uh, you were there just this last year. And when people came out of those camps, uh, they couldn't go back to their homes, Greta. And they, they went back to Israel. And the nation of Israel was reborn and the language that had been dead for 2,000 years. Mm -hmm was reborn. And you go to Israel today, everybody speaks Hebrew. They re read Hebrew, they write Hebrew. And all of that was foretold in the scriptures. The, uh, the prophets said that the nation of Israel will be reborn. And so we look at all this. God's in control, Greta. Mm -hmm. And God's directing things, I believe, according to his plan or to his purpose. And of course, we live in a fallen world. 
And uh, this is a world that has rejected God and rejected the authority of his son. But God is still behind the scenes moving things. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, when I, you know, when I think about, you know, everything that's going on in Israel, as, as what the Reverend just said, you know, what a tough, you know, what tough time it is, um, you know, for everybody, for whether you're, you know, whether you're Speaker of the House or American citizen or college student, it really is a tough time. And I, and a, and in t- today's like this, when you're sitting in, in, the, in the U.S. Capitol, you see people talking to each other and working together and on the same goal. And then, you, then you walk out the door and everybody's at each other's throats. Not everybody, but a good bit of it. Well, we're, we're trying to change that. You know, you can make an argument. We have the greatest collection of crises right now, probably since the World War II, maybe the Civil War. Some people argue if you look at all the headwinds that we're facing. But in spite of that, there is always this eternal hope. And that was the message of Reverend Graham, you know, that. Um, we do our duty, and at the end of the day, God is in control. He is sovereign, and we should point people to that truth. And it's a, it's a very liberating truth, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm often reminded of the words of John Quincy Adams, uh, who was our, you know, a president who then came to serve in the House of Representatives. And he brought that resolution over and over to end slavery, and he kept failing at it over and over. And as the story goes, he was sitting it, not far from where the stage was today in Statuary Hall. That's where his desk was in the, in the Congress. And a younger member of Congress went up to him and they said, uh, Mr. President, they still called him that. Why do you keep bringing the resolution? It keeps failing. Why do you why do you do it over and over? And he said, young man, duty is ours. Results are God's. And if you really accept that truth, which is a a biblical truth, um, it it really is a, a very liberating thing. Well, it's fun to see the entire Graham family here today, or a lot of them, your wife, Jane, Sissy, your boys, who are not boys anymore, but uh, everybody was here. (laughs) No, all the family was here, and all of us, again, uh, we are are thankful. When I say thankful, we're humbly thankful that our Father will be here in this capital for generations to come uh, to point people to our Heavenly Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. On the back, um, it has, you know, my father wanted to, on his gravestone. We didn't want there to be an argument after he died about what to put on his grave. So we asked Daddy before he died, Daddy, what do you want on your gravestone? He said, Preacher. Preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's on the back of this statue. Hmm. And uh, so that's who he is. He's uh, a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. Well, indeed, he is certainly uh, has left his mark on, on this world, and uh, as, as we can see today. Um, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here.